Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to Weekly Homilies with Father Mark Sislanko, pastor of Saints Isidore and Maria Parish in Glastonbury, Connecticut. We are part of the Catholic Archdiocese of Hartford. I'm Carol Vassar, Parish Director of Communications, and this is Season 3, Episode 28, for the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time, July 12th, 2020. Our Gospel reading is from Matthew, Chapter 13, Verses 1-9. through 9. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep, And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil, and produced fruit, and a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. Whoever has ears ought to hear. The Gospel of the Lord. It was toward the end of July, in fact, it may have even been the beginning of August, many years ago where a parishioner showed up at my door with a bag of the most beautiful tomatoes you ever saw in your life. These things were huge. And not only were they huge, but I was captivated by their color, which wasn't your traditional red, but more of a rosy salmon. So I knew Joe very well, and I said, Joe, what kind of tomatoes are these? And he said, they're right from Italy itself. They're called Corda d'Italia. And he went on to explain how his family has been raising these tomatoes for generation upon generation, always saving the seeds to plant for the next year. And I said, this is quite an impressive yield. And a visit to his house revealed this magnificent garden that these Corda di Italia tomatoes came from. Well, a little while after that, he showed up at my door again, and he gave me a package of seeds and said, Father, if you'd want to plant some yourself next year, here's some seeds to try. And of course, this was a great thing. And I was all excited, waiting for February to come when I could start my little pots with the little seeds and watch what happened. So I had everything all set up, everything was all ready to go, put the seeds in the pot, and lo and behold, they actually sprouted, actually sprouted. They grew into these nice little plants. I said, I really did this, you know, this is wonderful. A little part in the backyard that I had, you know, to plant a little garden kind of worked the soil a little bit, put the seeds that I had in the pots into the soil, watered them, and watched them grow. And they grew. And I said, wow, this is amazing. Look at this, from seeds that are generations old. And I have these wonderful tomatoes. But there was one problem, no fruit. Minimal yield. There was these little things that came out that kind of tried to turn red, but that was it. All these spots on them and all of this. I said, what happened to my tomatoes? I said, Joe, I said, you produced these magnificent things last year, the same season I got this. And he said, well, what did you do to the soil? I said, I kind of scratched it up, moved it around a little bit, put the things in, and that's it, watered it. He said, no. He said, your soil needs to be nurtured. He said, you didn't put the right stuff in. I said, ah. I was focusing on the seeds. Now there's a lesson here for our spiritual lives. We focus on the seed. You know, and we expect the seed to kind of just do what it's supposed to do because it is the seed, the Word of God. But we don't realize that God is sowing the seed all the time, the seed of his word, the seed of his presence. Generation upon generation, day after day, moment by moment, God's seed is being sown. 
Well, if God is sowing all this seed, why isn't it growing? Why isn't the kingdom of God here in more fullness? And why are we struggling with all of this stuff we find ourselves struggling with? And so we look, well, maybe God's not planting the seed. Or there's something wrong with the seed. Well, it's not the seed. It's the soil. And we forget to look inward and realize that in order to effectively receive the seed, something has to happen in here. This is the soil. Our souls and our hearts are the soil. Something has to change and be cultivated and nurtured in here before that seed that is sown begins to take root and change us and produce good fruit. Otherwise, it'll have minimal effect at best. And that's what happens with faith. You know, a lot of folks... They focus on the seed. Yes, I want to receive the word of God. They bring it into their hearts. But the plants look like they're growing good. The fruit's not there. In other words, they're doing all the right things that faith tells us they're supposed to do. But the lives that they're leading don't mirror the fruit that ought to be yielded as a result of them. Or some people say, well... If God's not going to do it, then why should I bother? And they go about the business of their lives thinking that all God has to do is sow this seed and the rest is supposed to be history, that somehow magically the kingdom of God is supposed to sprout up. And when it doesn't, they just turn away because, well, God can't either be doing too much or maybe God isn't at all. Or other folks are just so preoccupied with the stuff of their life. Work, commitments, getting ahead, success, increasing their bank accounts, doing what they want to do. All preoccupied with life stuff. Never giving pause to their relationship with God and God's seed. In fact, they may even be unaware of anything that's happening other than themselves. And God's seed can't take root there either. And some folks look at the word of God and the relationship with God and say, well, it's all about just rules. I don't need any more rules, and I don't like the structure of organized religion. And so they turn away because they wrongly believe that associating with God, associating with faith, is going to force them to do something that they may not want to do. They may have to change things up a bit, and they're not ready to do that. But you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the rules and regulations. You know, the purpose of a relationship with God has nothing to do with that. In fact, a relationship with God has nothing to do with getting to heaven either. You see, heaven is a gift. We forget that. You know, we sometimes think that the kingdom of God and heaven is something that I can earn merit toward. So, in other words, if I accumulate my bag of heavenly goods by doing all the right things, when I close my eyes in death, I go up to heaven, I meet God face to face, and I say, see... Look at all this good stuff I have that will allow me to enter into the kingdom. It doesn't work like that. God gives us the gift of life eternal just like he gives us the gift of his love. It's not something that we can folly for. It's not something we can compete for. It's a free gift. So what does God give us then? that is useful. He gives us our human selves. And the best and most perfect gift of faith is the gift of freedom. Freedom. Well, freedom from what? Well, freedom from anxiety, freedom from excessive worry, freedom from an over-attachment to the world's stuff, freedom from my sinfulness, Freedom from my myopic vision of life. 
freedom from my tendency to want to overly protect myself and marginalize those that don't fit into my vision of life, freedom from all of that stuff that bogs us down and gets us off skew on our journey to being a human being fully. Freedom. Freedom. You see, it's not just about being good. Anybody can do stuff that makes them look good. It's about being exceptional. It's about being exceptional. And see, we have to begin to understand that if God is in the DNA of humanity, if every person on this planet is created in the image and likeness of God, they can't sidestep over that relationship and still get where they need to go. You can't. If God is in the DNA of humanity, you have to embrace that relationship in order to be your best and most exceptional self. In all of our relationships, it works that way. You know, husband and wife who have a successful marriage relationship don't approach that with a minimal investment. They approach it with their best selves to make that union the best that it can be. Not for any other reason, but the gift of love. And so with God, it's the same way. So we invest in our relationship with God so that we can be free. And we can't find freedom, true freedom, in any other way. And so it stands to reason that if God is sowing all of this seed, then our challenge and our task is to cultivate this soil. So when that seed falls, it falls on ground that's able to receive it. And that's taking stock in how I prioritize my life, how I organize my life, the amount of time I spend in prayer, the amount of time I spend pursuing the Lord, the amount of time I spend working on Myself and looking at those areas of my life that need to be healed. Spending time looking at those areas of my life where I am held bondage to something else that is tethering me and keeping me from being free. And then in doing that, at the end of the day, we're going to have this abundant harvest, not for our own self-benefit, but for the benefit of others, because that's the twist. The harvest is meant to be shared. It's not about just making life better for me and for those I love, but for making my life a donation in service of other folks. That's the yield. And so the very freedom that makes us the exceptional human being we all want to be is the very gift that then allows ourselves to turn our lives over in service to God and my brother and sister and all of creation. It changes the lens. So as we ponder God's seed sowed daily, every moment, at all times, sowed on the soil of our lives, we see it take root. And when that fruit comes, may it be the best that can possibly be made because of God's word, but also because of the preparation that we have put into the soil of our souls and hearts. Father Mark Stislanko is the pastor of Saints Isidore and Maria Parish in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Learn more about our parish community at isidoreandmaria.org and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our music comes free of charge from Blue Dot Sessions in Fall River, Massachusetts. I'm Carol Vassar. Thanks for listening. <laughs>